Would you stand one more time and give a praise offering, a hand clap to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Thank you, Father. Amen. While you're standing, I don't do this much, but I believe I would be disobedient if I didn't give somebody a word. God impressed on me that some that I've got a word from him for somebody. You have been given the victory. Not because of who you are, but because of whose you are. Because of the risen king. You have the victory. Do you receive God's word? Amen. Be seated if you will. Father, we are overwhelmed by your goodness, grace, mercy, and love. Lord, we are in awe that the affairs of man would be utmost on your mind. Thank you, Father, that you love us like you do. Thank you for your unconditional love. Thank you for your love that surpasses everything we can understand. Lord, I pray tonight that the lost would be saved that the saints would be encouraged. Lord, that the captive would be set free. And Father, that the sick would be healed. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So be it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles, or as we've said before, in your electronic device. That still overwhelms me. James chapter 2. The great reformer, Martin Luther, called the book of James (laughs) a rather stingy letter. (laughs) Um, I want you to know uh, I've been stung before. By James. Um, I've been stung again, um, and you may or may not be stung. Um, We want to talk tonight about uh, spiritual maturity. We want to talk about the mature life. Why, in the name of heaven, our pastor asked me to preach this, I have no idea. but he'll pay for it one of these days. In talking about spiritual maturity, look at me. I want you to understand something. I'm not there, but I do thank God I'm not where I was. Now, I'm not where he's taking me yet. So I want to, I want to, uh, to preface everything that I'm saying tonight. I'm, I'm not there. But I'm working on it, bless God. I promise you that I'm not the same man that I was over 30 years ago. And I've not arrived, but I'm a little more mature than I was 30 years ago. So with that being in mind and realizing that the book of James, according to the great reformer, is rather stingy. If you get stung, it's not my fault. I'm just the paper boy. 
but I will deliver it close to the door tonight. Amen? It seems like every time I get an opportunity to preach, I have to ask you one question. Do you love Charlie? And then at the end, uh, I'm going to ask you again. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm Chad's dad, Charlie. Um, and I want to welcome our, I guess we're online. I don't know. But I, I got in my notes, welcome the online people. We're, Lord God, we're glad you're here. Let me tell you, um, our online service is, is, is larger than 90% of the churches in the country. Man can't do that. Amen. Amen. Give a pray. Let me tell you, God's the only one who can do that. Do you know what it means when a preacher takes his watch off? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Do you know what it means when your son tells you you've got 35 minutes? Yeah. Everything. Because <laughs> he won't let you preach again. Spiritual maturity. Without a doubt, the biggest problem we have in churches today and in society as well, is that of spiritual immaturity. We get ourselves into all kind of problems saying immature things. I should get an amen from some men in here. Do you hear me? You have said some immature things. To, maybe, maybe I'll preface that. Maybe it was just stupid and not immature. Amen? <laughs> there you go. One honest man, the rest of you, I'll tell you where you'll go. <laughs> we get in all kinds of problems saying immature things, making immature decisions, and by acting in immature ways. We need to become mature. In short, we need... Now, this is, a, this is what my mother would say. James, you think James was a little stingy? Boy, you need to meet Nanny. <laughs> Nanny wouldn't say you, don't, you need to become mature. Nanny would say you and I need to grow up. We want to look tonight in, uh, in God's Word in, in James chapter 2. The Bible says in verse 14, now, let me say one more thing. While this is stingy, um, this, these, these passages that we're going to look at tonight, this is not a debate on saving faith versus serving faith. Okay, I don't want you to understand that because when we get into it, it's not that debate. Let me tell you, saving faith and serving faith is the same. I'm saved, not by my works, but I'm saved for one thing. I'm saved to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus himself. And the way I do that is by my good works. Amen. James chapter 2. He says, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but no deeds? Can such a faith save him? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one, if, if one says to them, go in peace and keep warm and well fed, but does nothing to meet their physical needs, what good is that? He says, in the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. James says, show me your faith without your deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. He says, you believe that there is one God? Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? 
you see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person who is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent sent them off in different directions. Real important. As the body without the spirit is dead, so is faith without deeds. Now, let's look at this. Spiritual maturity. What is it? Well, let me tell you what spiritual maturity is not. And this is on your... Do I need to tell you when it's in the handout deal? Is that what Chad does? My God, I want to... You know... I got a call from him earlier, latter part of last week, and says, Pop, you've gone crazy with your filling. Well, I didn't know. It just looked like he had a lot of stuff on there, so I thought I'd put a lot on there, too. (laughs) So I went a little crazy. But if you'll remind me, I'll let you know when when you're supposed to do a filling. Let me tell you what spiritual maturity is not. Spiritual maturity is not a matter of age. How many of you have heard the old saying, no fool like an old fool? Amen. It's not a matter of age. Now, I'm a young 66. Amen. (laughs) I was shocked some of you thought I was 46. Well, that's close. Spiritual maturity is not, listen, is not a matter of age. I've seen... I've seen men a lot older than I am. This is, honest to goodness, crazy as a run-over dog. I mean, listen, you, you wonder how, when they get up in the morning, how, you know, who, who dresses them? Who, who, probably their wife, bless God, or their mother, if they probably still live at home in their mother's dress. But I'm going to tell you, spiritual maturity is not a matter of age. Spiritual maturity is not a, mat, a, a matter of appearance. How many of you know looks are deceiving? Amen. Let me tell you about that. I got a good one about this. Spiritual maturity is not a a matter of appearance. I remember years ago, went to a great golf club in the Mississippi Delta, the Greenville Country Club. The Greenville Country Club is a beautiful place, and and I, you know, I'd I'd played golf, but I'd, I'd never, I'd never had the privilege of having someone be a caddy for me. And I said, I have arrived. Do you hear me? We look, we pulled up there, and these guys came out there, and they got our golf bags out of the back of our car. And listen, I had I had a golf bag big, big around as this thing. My Lord, you, it'd take two men to haul it. But I had all the right equipment. Do you hear me? And I mean, they, they were shining, and they looked beautiful. And that caddy picked up my bag, and he says, I want this man right here. This old boy's got it together. Look at his bag. Well, we got up on the first tee. Flipped the coin, and I laid off. I got up there, boy, and I stood over that thing, and I mean, I hit that thing, and it duck hooked and went about 10 yards. Because, you know, they gamble. Now, I know none of us would ever do that, but they, those caddies, they put a little money on that stuff. Spiritual maturity... It is not a matter of appearance. Do you know what the next thing I heard out of that caddy's mouth was? <laughs> All bag and no golf. <laughs> and I saw him hand a $20 bill to the guy and said, it looks going to be a long day for me. <laughs> Spiritual maturity is not a matter of age. Spiritual maturity is not a matter of appearance. And let me tell you something. Spiritual maturity is not a matter of achievement. I've known and had the privilege to know some uh, some successful men over the course of the years. Men who'd made uh, made a lot of money. 
in the, and I'm not, listen, I'm not saying it's not good for us to make money. Lord God knows I need some. You hear me? I, I want to be successful. I'm not beating down success. I'm not beating down capitalism. What I'm telling you is, listen, spiritual maturity is not a matter of achievement. I can remember after I graduated from college and went to work for a great company. And I can remember looking at my wife and my sweet mother and telling them, I don't care what I've got to do. I don't care who I have to step on. I will climb the corporate ladder and I will be successful. I'd put my eyes on a man. He had had a lot of money and he was one of the senior partners in our firm. said, man, I want to be just like him. But you know what I noticed? I I noticed as those days went on and those months went on, I, I remember looking at him and I said, you know, I don't know that I want what he's got had the appearance of being successful and was absolutely miserable he had ulcers I mean you know that's self inflicted Um, he was an alcoholic lost his wife lost his children and I said you know I I don't believe I want Spiritual maturity is not a matter of age or appearance or achievement. Spiritual maturity is a matter of attitude and character. Did I tell you that's on the thing for you to fill out? <clears throat> In the book of James, we've just looked at that. That's our manual for spiritual maturity. If the Apostle James were alive today, he would be called the Show Me Apostle. You know where he'd be from? You know where he'd be from? Missouri. Show me. He says, show me. James makes the statement in James 2, verse 18 that we read. He said, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Now, again, James is not saying we're saved by our works, but we are saved to do good works. The mark of a, of a mature Christian, one, listen, who is progressing along that road of sanctification. You can look, look at his works. Look at his works. Look how he's living. And James outlines for us. Well, tonight I, I want to do. I want us to let's look at uh, at the at, at the, the life of a mature believer. First, I want us to look at an immature believer, and then I want us to look at a mature believer. In uh, an, an immature believer, listen, his uh, his faith is a is a deficient faith. It lacks something. There's no, there's no substance there. In First John, if I can find it, First John 3, verses 17 and 18. Listen to this. This is what the apostle John says. It says, if anyone has material possessions and he sees their brother or sister in need and has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us love one another with words, not with, let us love, not, well, now my mouth won't work. Dear children, let us not love with words or deeds, but in action and in truth. It's a deficient faith. The first thing, listen, I want us to look at is a, It's a saying faith. They say they have faith, but yet, listen, they may be prejudiced. They have special places for special people. Special treatment for special people. 
I've seen that in churches. I've never seen it here. But over the last 30 years, I've seen that. Oh, you sit here. Well, that's for you back here. We had, uh, we had a lady that dressed up. And I'd known her, gosh, for 10 years. She dressed up and she looked homeless. And she stood out in the foyer of our church. Not many people went by to welcome her. And it was an indictment upon our church. And he brought her out and put her on the podium. And when she took off all of that garb, people looked and says, My God, it's Jan Fenimore, whose husband was chairman of the deacons. Boy, you talking about an indictment. My Lord. I'm going to tell you, that changed our church. I can remember, listen, we're talking about people who say they have faith. It's part of that division. You've seen it. Boy, oh, yeah, man, my goodness. I'm, I, they'll tell you everything. I know this, I know that, I know this. But you know what? You got a heart problem. It's a saying faith. It lacks substance. Let me tell you something else about a saying faith. Their talk does not match their walk. They live one way at church, <laughs> live another way at home. A mature man, let me tell you, and a mature woman, they act the same. You know, they say confession is good for the soul. It's bad for the reputation. I'm going to confess something to you. I don't know how it is in your life when you're getting ready to come to church on Sunday. But I can tell you how it used to be in hours. Sunday school started at 9.45. Then we had church after that. Well, I was a Sunday school teacher. I got to be there. Need to be there by 9.30. 9.15 would be great. It seemed to me like for our children, time wasn't anything but a magazine. <laughs> we had some of the worst fights in the entire world. I have threatened them with everything that was holy. And it's not going to be this way next Sunday. And next Sunday rolled around, guess what? Same thing. Time, nothing but magazine well finally we had got i started to work for a company we had two cars that solved a lot of our problems do you hear me i made the journey to church alone by myself a lot of times but bless god we didn't fight either listen it's a saying faith their talk doesn't match their walk let me tell you something else about those who say they have faith and 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 nothing else they substitute their faith for with words and, and not deeds. Not only is it a saying faith and their talk doesn't match their walk, it, theirs is a workless faith that produces a worthless faith. Let me tell you, mature adults, mature believers, they stay busy. They're looking for opportunities to serve. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I tell you this when you, every time you come into one of the, was it Coastal Connect, when we tell you what we believe and, you know, if you want to join us. Let me tell you, there's some work being done in all the churches that's not being done in churches all over the country, all over the world, that's not being done because God has specifically and uniquely fashioned one individual for that work. Now, I'm not saying the work's not getting done, but it's not being done, listen, to the full extent that it needs to be done because God has uniquely fashioned each and every one of us for a specific giftedness in the church. So I want to tell you, the mark of a, the mark of a mature believer is, listen, they're busy. They're busy at work. They're busy at worship. They're busy at Bible study. 
You know, one thing about this thing, about this, uh, this deficient faith or this, this uh, saying faith, oh, man, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. That'd be the first ones to leave a church. You know why? You know what's the number one reason? And I've heard this. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this. Well, you know, I go say, man, we've missed y'all church. Why aren't you coming? Well, we, we decided to leave. Well, what's wrong? Well, I'm not being fed. Really? You're not being fed at church. Yep, that's why I'm leaving. That, that preacher, just he's not feeding me. Pretty shallow. I guess you could lose a lot of weight if you didn't eat but one meal a week. I'm pretty sure you could. I'm going to tell you. And I'm not saying this because he's my son, because I've made this, I've preached this before. It's not, it's not the pastor's responsibility to feed you. My God, who feeds you the other times you eat? Who feeds you? Trent, when you got up this morning, did your mother feed you? You better, by the way, hold on one second. This doesn't take in my time. Do you hear me? This is Trent Cook, best dressed man in the house. Trent, would you stand up one second? Best dressed man in the house. Glory to God. They'll kill all of us for that. Do you hear me? Let me tell you, they'll leave the church. Well, I'm not being fed. Let me tell you, the mark of an immature Christian, an immature believer, with saying faith, is listen, he's an idol. He doesn't work. He's sh- the next one I want to look at is shallow. He's shallow faith. These people can defend the faith, but they never demonstrate their faith. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to go ahead and give this to you. This doesn't cost you anything. You never argue the Bible with anybody, okay? I I never argue the Bible. You don't need to argue the Bible. It doesn't do any good. You're just going to make somebody mad. Now, I'll I'll tell them, you know, we can agree to disagree. Amen? I don't argue the Bible. You don't need to argue the Bible either. But I've had these people, look, they'll defend the faith. Oh, I can defend the faith. And you ask them to, to go get... Go get somebody a glass of water. My God, you'd think you'd done, you know, something unholy. <laughs> they wouldn't move a chair or a table in the church if, if hell froze over. I'm going to tell you, I told somebody the other day, I wish, LD, I wish I had a nickel for every chair and every table that I've set up and took down over the last 30 years. I'd retire. Do you hear me? Comfortably. <laughs> and LD, you could too. I'd take him with me. I'd, that's how many chairs we set up. And I'm not bright. Listen, that's, that's, I do it because I want to. I get to. Shallow faith. They'll defend the faith but never demonstrate the faith. They're church hoppers. Looking for the next great experience. Their faith is based on feelings and not on fact. They look for that next spiritual high, the uh, the emotions. And let me tell you, when your life and your faith is based on feelings and not on fact, when you get the test, and Chad had talked, Pastor Chad talked about this last week, when you get under pressure, guess what? You will fold, you will wilt like a flower if everything you know is based on feelings and not on facts. Where people of facts. These are our facts, and we live by those facts. Feelings. Now, I'm not saying it's not good for us to have feelings. I'm not saying that. But when you base your life on it, can you imagine me going to Sharon tomorrow? Well, sweet Sharon, my cheerleader of 45 years, I don't feel very married today. After I pick myself up off the table, I mean off the floor <laughs> from that cast iron skillet upside the head. If I went to that sweet cheerleader and I told her, you know, sugar, I don't feel very married today. You know what she'd say? On June the 26th, 19, whatever it was, 45 years ago, you said, I do, and you did. And that's a fact. 
Let me tell you. You base your you base your you base your faith on feelings. You'll be crushed in your immature, and it's shallow. Well, we got to hurry up. The next one is serving faith, in this deficient faith. It's confession without commitment. Confession, and you can go and read it, 1 Corinthians 13, 11 for yourself. That's why I've got you a confession without commitment. Confession, boy, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. Wouldn't do anything. Let me tell you, look at me. Confession without commitment, without doing something with that commitment, confession without commitment is vain babbling. You may as well just be talking in the wind. If a man, listen, has a great confession, and we do, boy, that the Lord Jesus saved us from our sins. Listen, we will spend eternity with him in heaven. He promises us a great, wonderful life. Now, he didn't say it was going to be easy. But let me tell you, confession without commitment. If all you're doing is talking, can I just tell you and remind you of something? Talk's cheap. And there's a, that's the self-serving. Let me read, let me read 1 Corinthians 13, 11 for you. I guess I, 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 I've got to share this with you. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. Now, this is a word for us. Look, listen close. He said, Paul says to the church at Corinth, he says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. Now, listen to this. Paul says, when I became a man, I put away childish things. This self-serving faith, confession without commitment. This faith may grow old, but it never grows up. Is that on your eye? You star circle and underline that one. Do you hear me? And you put Pastor Charlie by that one. You know what Paul's saying here? For a lot of us, for the first 10 years of our marriage, I'm going to tell you. I'd graduated college. But you know what? For 10 years, I was still like living like that fraternity boy. I was growing older, but I was not growing up. What did Paul say? Paul said, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. He said, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, this is a little stingy. Some of us are still, men look at me. Some of us are still living like we were in a fraternity. Like we were still college boys. The Apostle James and Nanny have a word for us. Two words. Grow You are not a child anymore. Do you still love Charlie? I didn't get much there, but I don't. (laughs) Well, so much for all of that. Amen. Let's leave the deficient faith. Dear God, I'm tired of that mess. Amen. I'm going to grow up. I'm going to be the man God's called me to be. And then, listen, let's talk about the next one. It's called a a dynamic faith. Or listen, we talked under the deficient. It was, a, it was a saying faith. Under dynamic, listen, it's a showing, fake, a showing faith. Actions speak, our actions speak louder than words. This is a faith that's a result of a changed life that leads to good works. First Timothy. 
1 Timothy 6, 18. If they hadn't moved it, I want to find it. I want to read 1 Timothy 6, 18 to you. How much time have I got? <laughs> Did I tell you what that means? Nothing. <laughs> he won't let me preach anymore. Well, I can't find Timothy. I know it's in there somewhere. 1 Timothy, here it is. 618. Here's what Paul said to Timothy and Timothy to the church. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous, willing to share. Let me tell you, a mature faith is a showing faith. It's, it's actions, speaks louder than words. It's the result of a changed life that leads to good works. And mature works are an evidence of sincere faith. I don't know, I don't know a lot of folks that had never questioned their salvation. I've questioned my salvation before. I mean, that's, it's only natural sometimes we'll get you know, in the heat. Boy, am I really saved or not? Let me give you a, a couple of good tests for realizing if you're, if you're saved. Number one, let me tell you, if you can sin and enjoy it and you say you're born again, chances are you probably need to go back. I mean, now look, I'm not talking about sinless perfection, okay? But I'm going to just tell you, if you can sin and enjoy it, you might want to go back and look what you got. Because I'm going to tell you, and the older I get and the more I read in here, Man, the quicker he is to hit me in the head with a hammer. I mean, my Lord, I said, you know, well, this wasn't sin yesterday, and today is today. Come on. If you can sin and still enjoy it, let me tell you, you might want to go back and look what you got. And if you can, listen, if, if in, your, in your Christian walk, if you're not ministering to somebody other than yourself, you might want to go look and see what you've got. My God, there's, listen, there's 12, 1,200 people that, that are here every Sunday. That you, I'm sure somebody in there needs somebody to minister to them. And let me tell you, God's looking for somebody to minister to somebody else. You know, I told you a few minutes ago, I come here to, to be encouraged by, the, by God's teaching from his, from his servant. But you know why else I come? I come to be encouraged by you. And I am encouraged, and that's what the Bible says. Paul says, listen, don't fail not to come together corporately and worship and to be encouraged. Man, you encourage me. What are you doing up here? <laughs> Is it time? That's a polite way to so say we got to hurry up. <laughs> Old Chad never let me preach again. Well, bless God, he'll have to come back next week <laughs> or find somebody else. Amen. He says he can do that. Listen, dynamic faith, it's a showing faith. Not only is it a showing faith, it's a steadfast, it's a steadfast faith. Practicing what we preach. We take God at his word and we do what God tells us to do. And let me tell you, attitude and character make the difference. I'm going to tell you, God tells me to do some things sometimes that I don't like doing. I remember years ago, I had, and by the way, did you notice I got me a brand new Bible? No tape on this thing holding it together, brand new, just so I could teach you tonight. I remember years ago, Jason, I had been marking up a Bible. Man, I had some of the greatest notes in that thing. Woo! If I had it, I would never have to study again. I'd just go back and read my notes. You hear me? Because I heard something. Every time I'd listen, and we went to a church a lot. <laughs> And I went to everything I could go to. Man, I was just, God was just showing me great things. I was sitting under great men. Man, I had me some notes in that thing. I said, boy, bless God. Woo. You can ask me a question, I can go right there to it. Man, I here's your answer right here. Had me an index in the front of it. And I remember I was in Dallas, Texas, and my friend Sam Maurice had a chance to witness to Sam. Excuse me. And Sam Maurice gloriously saved. Man, I was on the high. Woo! And I said, Sam, you need to get you a good Bible. And I 
That's where I messed up. Because the Holy Spirit said, Give Sam your Bible. Tell him? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I've been marking this Bible up for all these years. He said, You didn't mark that Bible up for you. You marked that Bible up for Sam Maurice. I still didn't want to give him my Bible. But I gave him my Bible years later. Got a card in the mail. It's from Sam Maurice. He said, I just wanted you to know I was reading your Bible today. I wrote him back and I said, no, Sam, it's yours. So listen, attitude and character. Attitude. It took him a little while to convince me. <laughs> Character, let me tell you, real important. Men, look at me one more time. Character in the mature believer is developed not overnight. Character for you and I is, listen, the things we do when nobody else Not long after God had convicted me that he was going to kill me if I didn't quit drinking. <laughs> I remember I went to, uh, had to go to the coast for something. We were living in Hattiesburg. You know, when, how many I told you this story? I went into a quick stop. And, and I would give me a Diet Coke. To get to the Diet Coke, had, Diet Coke had to pass by the beer cooler. Man, I, I walked by there and I said, "Oh my God, look, there's Miller Lite." <laughs> now, look, I, you know, you know, my look, yeah, you can, you can do it. I, I can't handle it, so it's sin to me. It may not be sin to you. And you know, the voice I heard, the voice I heard said this: "Nobody will ever know. Why don't you just get you one?" I turned around and boy, I got my diet coke. I went and put $2 on the table. Didn't even want my change. I said, I got to get out of here because if I turn around and look at it, I'll turn into a Miller Lite can. <laughs> Remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, the lady that got turned into a pillow of salt. Attitude and character. Man, listen. Those things that we do, there's character when no one's around. Then there's a serving face, and I got to hurry. What are you doing up here? <laughs> Mature faith finds fulfillment in action. Listen, the mature believer, he's not happy unless he's helping somebody, unless he's doing something. The mature faith is accompanied by genuine works as, to pose, as opposed to those self-serving individuals we talked about. Listen, genuine work. Mature faith continually contributes to spiritual growth and, develop, and development on two levels real quick mature faith continually contributes to spiritual growth and development I've, number one listen me I've got to I've got to grow spiritually I've got to develop me spiritually and then number two it invests in the spiritual growth of others Real quick, things for us to think about it and then we're done. To gain spiritual maturity, a believer must be what God wants him to be and do what God wants him to do when God says do it. Number two, mature believers are produced through perseverance in trials. You'll know how mature you are, how you respond. Number three, for the mature believer, faith and work should not be confused with each other, but neither can they be separated from each other. Faith and works. If you say you have faith, show me by your good works. Mark Twain says this, the most important two days of your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. 
Charlie Stafford says, for the mature believer, believer, we know why though. We know the why. Why? Why was I born? Why was I saved to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus? You're going to have an opportunity here in a few minutes to talk over some questions that, uh, that we've, we've developed for you. I just want you to, to take one second. Let's take more than that. And ask God through his Holy Spirit just to show you. Am I progressing? Let me tell you. I promise you, I'm not the same man. I told you this. I was 30 years ago. I'm going to tell you. I'm not the same man I was five years ago. Sweet Shay and I were pretty comfortable in a church that we had attended for 30 years. I'm going to tell you, our pastor has stretched us. (laughs) But I've never been part of anything, ever. It's more enjoyable. It's more rewarding than to see what's happening here. He tells you, and I want to be sure you understand it. You are the greatest church in the world. You know what? Because Chad said it. And I say it. God says it. You know what? What we see and what we're experiencing here as a body of believers cannot be explained by man. Only God can do this. Amen. We're the group leaders. Oh, but I forgot to ask you, do you still love old Charlie even though we were a little st- a, a little a little sticky? Do you forgive him for getting a little sticky, throwing the throwing the uh, paper a little too close to the front door? Amen. Well, you got that second hand. You ought to have been there when I got it. I mean, he beat me to death with it. It's my prayer that uh, we'll continue to grow and continue to mature. Father, thank you for the body of Christ. Lord, thank you for the coastal church. Thank you for the deep love that we have for you and the deep love that we have for each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, group leaders, question, where are they? Stand up, give you things, and y'all spend a few minutes reflecting. I love you and thank you for letting me do this. I'm sorry, bub. <laughs>